Okay, thanks everybody for coming. And for all of you in the room that don't know what you're here for, this is, <laughs> hopefully um, you will enjoy it as well. So thanks for staying, have some food. I'm Elizabeth Cowell, I'm the university librarian here at UC Santa Cruz. And last year I had a conversation with a really good friend of the library and donor, Mark Headley, and his path to his success was so interesting to me that I thought, as a student, wouldn't it be nice to hear from successful alums <clears throat> who had maybe an indirect path to success or kind of an interesting story to tell about their experience here and where they came after that. So Mark um, generously funded what we're calling the Human Book Project. So 110,000 people, students, have graduated from UC Santa Cruz since we started, which seems like a ton, but it's been 50 years. Older universities have like, you know, many more than that, but I think that's a pretty impressive number. So um, today, hopefully, you'll learn something new and interesting. And I'd like to thank Nancy cox Konopelski for bringing Eric, Dr. Eric Jackson to us, who it was a chemistry major here at UC Santa Cruz and graduated in 1996 from Rachel Carson College, though back in the day it was called College 8. Eight. So he is a, an MD focusing on urgent care, occupational medicine. He's an inventor, a technology consultant, a community leader, and he was featured on Oprah's Big Give. So you might wanna ask him about that. So kind of the key about this whole program is that it's not just a broadcast situation where you hear from Eric. We want you to ask him questions, challenge him, really kind of get some good information that will help you on your paths to success. Because I know for myself, it wasn't A to B. It was A to F to C to Z all over the place. So hopefully this will give you some ideas and you'll have some questions to ask Dr. Jackson. So thank you. You're very welcome. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very nice intro. Uh, she is correct. I did graduate here. Actually, 95 degree in chemistry. And uh, it is an unbelievable honor to, to come back and to share this information I'm going to share with you guys because it's, it's been a journey. It's, 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 it's going to be a journey for all of you guys. Uh, you will start someplace, and um, as Liz was saying, you'll hit some corners and hit some bumps, and it won't be an A to B to C. It'll be a kind of zigzag situation, and if you just stay focused and uh, on your goal and on your task, you're going to make it. So during these years, since I graduated in 95, I have been around the world quite a bit. Um, it's been a whirlwind. Uh, a lot of success. I've had some failures. I'm going to talk to you about that, how to recover from your failures if you fall forward. And I can tell you right now, guys, you're not going to get through this thing and get to success without some failures, without some setbacks, without some things that's going to be an impedance. Okay? But that's how life challenges you. So with that being said, this is called the biology and physiology of success because one of the things I didn't want to do is come by and give you that regular old hoopla of if you just believe, you can achieve, right? We've all heard that, right? But really, what does that mean? What does belief mean? What does achieve mean? How does the body interact with all that? As a physician, uh, now, you know, one of the main questions for me, I've been to Tony Robbins, I've been to Earl Nightingale, I've been to Napoleon Hill, I've been to a number of seminars trying to find that avenue of success. And so what, what happened is I would walk into these seminars and they would have these big signs, hey, change your life, you know, live a better, more fruitful, eventful life or become more abundant. And I would go in, I'd get fired up. That same day I walk out like I'm the king of the world, I'm about to go conquer everything. The next day, it'll be 50% less. A few more days later, I find that my mindset, my energy level was back to where I was before I went to the seminar. Nothing had really changed. So that led me on a lifelong journey to really figure out what is success and what does that entail? What do we need to do? How do we need to talk? How do we need to act? How do we need to think? How do we need to feel, okay? Because what I'm gonna teach you today 
Um, some of this stuff will be brand new to you guys. Some of this will be an introduction to something that you will start on your own journey in research and you'll find the answers for yourself. There are some concepts that will be broken down. So what I'm gonna ask you guys to do today, two things. One is, I want you to have an open mind right now, okay? Everything that you've ever learned, everything that you've ever thought, said to yourself up to this point has gotten you here. But today, if you really truly pay attention, it'll be a game changer for somebody in this room. Somebody's gonna walk away here, an enlightened human being, they're gonna go and go forward from this day forward, everything is gonna start to spiral up for them, there will be a huge success, okay? So, let's see. Is that the button? No. Enter. How do we go next here? There we go. All right, so today, you know, what, one of the things I want to do is go over how do you succeed in class. That's going to be very brief. Um, it's something I learned from a good friend of mine's dad. He's a plastic surgeon. This is the method that I used um, uh, uh, at Harvard. This is the method that I used at UCLA Medical School to study, um, to gain mastery, and to also have a good time. I'm going to tell you my story briefly, then I'm going to tell you what I've learned up to this point. Then we're going to talk about some of the components of success. How is the human being as an organism, as a machine, uh, the human being as a consciousness? And then what is the human success machine? Because what you guys got to realize is actually you guys are geared for success. You have a cerebral mechanism in your brain right now that is geared for success. It makes you aware of things. It helps you reason, it helps your perception, and it's a guidance mechanism for your success. The other thing is, I've learned over the years, if you wanna have something, you gotta do certain things. But in order to do those things, to have that life or to have that thing, you gotta be, okay? This is called the human success book, but what comes after human? Is it doing or being? Being, you're not a human doing, you're a human being. And for me, that took years to really have that understanding that before I go about trying to have something in my life, I need to actually be that person that does the things that then will manifest the things you want to have in your life. So there's a mechanism to make yourself into the person that you intend to become. And I'm going to teach you that today as well. Then we're going to talk about how to live your dreams and your purpose. Okay? So let's see, return. So just briefly, um, I grew up in L.A., uh, not the wealthiest part of L.A., okay? My mother um, instilled in me just, you know, hey, go hard, be successful, do you. I uh, was in a highly uh, gifted magnet. We took some tests, and I ended up going uh, to this highly gifted magnet school. Then I went to a medical magnet, North Hollywood Biological Sciences Zoo Magnet, where everyone who came in with me had the determination to go to medical school, and there was actually only two who uh, made it um, to that goal. Then uh, here at UCSC for four years, uh, chemistry major, played on the basketball team. I was in the acting theater arts troupe. I was an alpha man. I volunteered at Santa Cruz High School teaching the kids. Uh, I did the MARC MBRS program, participated in the ACE program, traveled to China to work with kids in China um, on their English, um, all at the same time while majoring in chemistry and preparing to go to medical school. And everything was a challenge and everything was done to the most excellent level. Joe might not agree with that. <laughs> um, you did, I do remember that. Um, and then after that I left UCSC, my father was in a car accident. Uh, the December before graduation. He was in a coma for six months. And I took care of him. Um, then he passed. After that, uh, I decided to continue to pursue my dreams in medicine and uh, went to Harvard um, for two years. Took the MCAT again, got into UCLA, uh, came back uh, to Los Angeles. I was there for four years did my residency studies, and uh, now I am the area medical director for the largest urgent care occupational medicine center in the country, who's now merging with the other largest uh, uh, occupational medicine and urgent care center in the country. So instead of our 260 clinics total, we'll have about 585 clinics total nationwide, okay? And um, our region is the Northern California region. Total, we see about 15,000 patients a day. 
We have about 550 new injuries a day. Um, I manage about 30 docs, um, some PAs and nurse practitioners. And I'll tell you guys something, it's a lot of fun, okay? I love what I do. Um, it's the reason why I went to med school. But um, today, I wanna take all of these experiences, all of my knowledge, all of the seminars I've went to, all of the books that I've read over the years, really trying to figure out, hey, is there some, you know, when you, when you make coffee, you put it in the coffee pot, you add the water, you turn it on, you get coffee. So my question was, is there something like that for success, right? Or can, is there something to take me from here to here and then even beyond? And the answer to that question is yes. So I just wanna get right into it. Oh, before we start, I'll tell you this. Um, about four years ago, I ran into a book called The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss. And the idea was set up online businesses for residual income and only work four hours a week. And then you make $2,000, $2,000, $3,000 a month. That led me. And so what happened was you go and set up a website. But one of the things you guys don't understand is when you type in you know, a keyword for Google and you're not on page one, guess what? You don't get the clicks. So I had all these websites, but I wasn't getting the clicks. I thought that it was just like the store. You open the store and patients will come or people will come. But that wasn't the case. So I had to go out and learn search engine optimization and search engine marketing. And now all, every single of my websites, I personally own about 185 websites for various directories and various niches and stuff like that. And they're all on page one of Google. So we get, uh, I'll tell you guys something right now. Google money is the best money ever, okay? You set it up, you get clicks, 24 hours a day, 365 days a week, every day I wake up, it's like Christmas. It's a true story. Um, so now I own a company, we do web design, development, we Google AdWords and stuff like that, uh, ad clicks. The 4-Hour Workweek um, is one book that I used, and then the other one is called Get Rich Click by a guy named Ostrovsky, and he goes into a lot more of the search engine marketing and online uh, ways to make money and stuff like that. We also make mobile apps. We have about six apps in the App Store now, and uh, we're still going. So after 20 years, okay, this is what I came back to tell you guys, okay? So if you took the Vine, the entire grape vine at a winery, and you took all the grapes and squished them together, and you got that fine grape juice, okay? This is that presentation. All the other stuff is fluff. What I'm gonna give you guys is world tested. I used it. I know guys who are in medical school, law school, dental school, business, uh, 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 business successes that use this methodology as well. So number one, I just wanna tell you guys, it's not as hard as you think. So what I would like you to do right now is everybody sit up, okay? I want you to take a deep breath in, in, and then just take a breathe out and just feel that ease come in. Because you should feel satisfied in that after 20 years of researching this, that I come back and tell you, that is not as hard as you think. Key word is not as hard. Well, that's actually a phrase, but the key word is think, okay? Uh, the human mind is amazing. It's your greatest asset. We're gonna go into that. Um, it's important here that you got to understand that you're never going to achieve success beyond what you think and see of yourself. So your self image is your anchor that's either going to tether you down or it's going to propel you forward into the success that you desire. Self image will actually make you self sabotage yourself if your self image doesn't match your self ideal, which is the ideal image you see yourself as then there's a disconnect. And so your, your, your self-image will make you then self-sabotage yourself or create ways of failure so that you can always match the self-image, not the self-ideal, okay? We're gonna talk about that as well. The other thing is everybody's great in their own way. There are talents that you have there's things that you can do that no one else on this planet can do better than you. No one else in history or no one else coming after this point in our history, in our timeline. So you just don't know it yet. Another important thing is to make sure that you guys not only know that you have greatness, but to treat everybody else like they have greatness as well. The bigger the dream, the better your dream should sound scary. Now, the only reason I put this in here is to decide, believe, achieve, and work hard. 
is uh, kind of kind of felt like I had to say that in a way because how can you not say if you you know believe you can achieve? It's just so common. But we're going to go into why is that really crucially important? Okay. Um, the other thing is don't let your past failures determine your future successes because your past failures you should learn from, learn the lesson, and move on to the next. That's called failing forward, okay? Now, you can fail backwards and be stuck in that same place five years later of the mentality of that exact same failure and then therefore project that failure onto everything else that you do, okay? The other thing is don't let your past successes lull you into complacency, right? You feel good, you graduated high school, right? Now you're at UCSC, college eight, chemistry major, take the first test because you got an A in chemistry in high school, take the first test in college and get a C. That blew me away, that was actually my story. I was like, whoa, I got a C, what? But I was like kind of hanging on to the high school aspect of chemistry and where I was as opposed to being where I am, okay? Here's the most important thing. Number one, you have an automatic success mechanism. It's called cybernetics. It's the same thing that the missiles use when they have a target and the missile doesn't go in an arc like this, okay, and hits the target. It actually goes out to the left a little bit, back to the right, to the left, and it zigzags, and then it zigzags, and then finally hits the target. It's called cybernetics, and there's a component in the brain called psycho. Cybernetics, we're gonna talk about that briefly. Number, the other thing is, you need to work harder on yourself, smarter on yourself than in your class and on your jobs. Most Americans do not work on themselves. They go to work, then they go home, and that's it. And they wonder why they stay in the same place, okay? You can never get anything new in your life, okay, if you don't think differently, right? Einstein said, you can never solve a problem at the level of the problem. You gotta think above and beyond the problem, be bigger than the problem and the issue to be able to solve it correctly. And then finally, I have a line right here because this is the essence of everything, okay? Number one, you gotta wake up and be grateful for everything that you have in your life, your dorm room, your books, your laptops, your bags, your computers, your clothing. I mean, it sounds so like, seriously, after 20 years, are you gonna teach, tell me to be grateful? Listen, the attitude of gratitude will bring you more in your life than any action that you can ever make, okay? Love, love is all there is, that's it. Any anger, anything that's negative is the absence of the light, is the absence of love, you know? Joe Konopelski's here is one of our organic chemists and he'll tell you, those chemical bonds are made with love. Those are everlasting bonds. You can never make an everlasting bond without a component of some likeness, without a component of some love, okay? So at this point, now we're gonna get into it. These are kind of like the outlines and stuff of what I've learned, but now I wanna get into some more details, down to some nitty gritty kind of stuff, okay? So here are the principles, psycho-cybernetics. Who is your uh, most important information source? In other words, who are you listening to, okay? Uh, how teachable are you? Okay, where's your physical and, and mental energy balance? And then finally, we're gonna talk about the different levels of information mastery. Okay, so number one, psycho-cybernetics. Dr. Maxwell Moss was a plastic surgeon. What he found was he would perform these surgeries and people were still not satisfied. And he didn't really understand why. So what he did was he pursued this mechanism of making positive outcomes based on visualization, okay? And based on the fact that if you wanna go here, okay, you gotta keep this visualization at this point, no matter where you're starting, and not worry about the how. The how will come as you become who you need to be. So, so what he said was, hey, you know, concentration on your inner attitudes uh, is very important, and basically, your outer success comes from whatever it is you visualize internally. And we're gonna talk about why. I've heard this before, and you guys have probably heard this too. Has anyone ever heard of hey, if you really want to be successful, just hold the image of that success in your mind? Yeah. Raise your hand. Just, just raise your hand, let me see. Okay, but now based on that, keep them up for a second. Keep them up, everybody. Okay, now with your other hand, 
and everyone's other hand, do you know why? And see, no one raised their hand. And that's where I was 20 years ago. Because I heard this, you know, I got Think and Grow Rich, I got all these books, I'm thinking I'm gonna read the book, then I'm gonna apply it, and that's it, right? But there is another component that we are all missing and that all of these lessons were missing in terms of creating the life. What's the difference between creation and evolution? Or creating and evolving, anybody? Nobody, okay. Creating is bringing about something new that did not exist previously. Evolving is taking something that already existed and improving upon that, hopefully, or making a change from something that already exists, okay? So we're gonna talk about creating success. So number one, who, who do you listen to? Here's a question. Are you listening to the high school teacher that told you that you may or may not be able to make it? Are you listening to the high school counselor that actually said, um, uh, don't, don't go to UC Santa Cruz. Go to a JC and then transfer to a four-year university. Okay? That's what my college counselor said. Or um, here at UCSC, my college, the counselor said, um, she opened the folder. She looked at everything. She saw the GPA. And she must have skipped the fact that uh, we had the highest scores in the, the biological sciences history. She goes, aren't you? So I think I want to major in chemistry and, and be a pediatrician. And she said, didn't you play basketball? Don't you, aren't you on the basketball team? I said, yeah. She said, why don't you major in sociology? And you can be a PE school teacher. Like she was selling that to me. Like, you can be a PE school teacher, guys, come on. Right? I'm like, what? If I let her make that self-image of me, I would not be standing here before you guys today. Obviously, I did not listen to her. The question is, who are you listening to? Because sometimes you can listen to certain things on a conscious level and it impacts you on an unconscious level. And you don't really know that you're moving from that unconscious aspect of what the other person placed on your life instead of yourself. OK, so that's just an examination. Who are you listening to? Your parents? Are you listening to the guy who thought that he was going to be successful in business but wasn't and now he's telling you not to? Or the young lady or whoever it is, okay? Who did you listen to in the past? In high school, junior high, elementary even, okay? Some of these aspects remain with your life throughout. I got guys that's 35 still in the 10th grade, mentally. So who are you listening to? And the question is, is that information that you previously listened to actually serving you at this point in your life. If it's not, there's an aspect of learning new things, but then there's another aspect of letting things go that are irrelevant to you at this point. And that's for you guys to determine, okay? Where that information lies and what it is you need to let go. And important question is, who is controlling your image of you? Because as an organism, as a human being, you have external stimuli, and then you have internal stimuli. And sometimes the external stimuli tends to always be greater than the internal stimuli and what you really want to say to yourself. Okay, so uh, why should you listen to me? Like, you don't know me, Nancy introduced me, and introduced me. I'll tell you why. Because what I'm telling you today, this is not just um, tested by myself, Okay? This is tested by a bunch of other people who are extremely successful. I don't like to waste time. Okay? If I go to the doc, the doc is 10 minutes late. I don't care. I'm out. I hate waiting. So this is not a waste of time. Then the average age in here is about what? 19, 18 or something like that? Okay. How smart were you 10 years ago? I like that. Uh, not even close. Do you think you can be here going to class? If you were, how, how do you know? You. Um, 1920. Okay, so you're, you're, okay, so could you go here? Could you be a student here when you were 10? No. no. Can any, anyone? I know I could not have been a student here when I was 10. The point of that question is, that's 10 years. I'm talking about 20 years of study, 20 years of experience, 20 years of trial and error, 20 years of failing, 20 years of extreme success. And this is all distilled down into this point tonight. That's why you should listen to me, okay? Next question is now, how teachable are you? Okay, how willing are you to learn and change 
based on the information that you now have incorporated into your life, okay? Because um, one aspect of being open in, in, in allowing that new information is a willingness to go beyond your current perception, your current perception of life, your current perception of yourself, okay? How teachable are you, right? Is the glass half full or half empty? Well, if it's half empty, well then that's one perspective, but the next question is, if the glass is full, right, there's no more water or, or fluid or liquid to put in the glass, how can that inside of that glass expand anymore? It can't, you gotta expand the cup. In other words, you can never reach the limit of learning. My mentors, okay, is in their 70s. My mentor's mentors is in his 90s. And he's still reading every day. He's still going hard every single day, okay? So in order to get something different in your life, you gotta change your thinking first, and a part of that is being teachable. Next question is, how balanced are you on your mental action and physical action? I'll tell you, when I was here, I was almost all physical. There were no visualizations of success first and then go achieve it. It was, oh, I have old Kim class. I'm going to old Kim class. I'm going to knock this out. Now I got to go do research with Phil Cruz. I'm going to do research with Phil Cruz. I got basketball practice at five. Here I go to basketball practice. It was just really physicality, protein at work. Okay. But I knew I had a goal. But I did not use this mechanism as well as I could have, and I'm gonna teach this to you guys today. So on one side is the vibration, the feelings, the emotions, the thoughts, the desires, that's the being part, okay? The other aspect is going to class, doing the studies, meeting with groups, all your physical actions, your, te your study techniques, you know, how you go to the library. Um, are you going to the library and wasting time? If you're there for four hours, you get four hours worth of work, or are you there for four hours, you actually get 30 minutes? worth of work, okay? Everybody's had those days. That's doing, okay? And it has to be a balance of being and doing, okay? Um, this other aspect is expanding life into your own realms. Here's another key, guys. You guys spend a lot of time doing. You're already successful, otherwise you wouldn't be here. But I'll tell you a secret, 99.9 percent of your overall success is thought. 99.9 percent .9 of your success is thought, which explains why there's a lot of people that's doing a lot but achieving so little. They don't have the thought component there. They don't have the visualization component there. We're going to talk about how to get it. Uh, focus on, on what your thoughts are, okay? Uh, most failures focus on the how. How am I going to get this money for this business? How am I going to build this business? How am I going to become a lawyer? How am I going to become a doctor? It's not about the how. It's about the being. We're going to get to that a little bit more as well. Okay. So the levels of learning. Okay. You have unconscious incompetence. You just don't know what you don't know. Okay. You don't know anything. You're unconsciously incompetent, or you can call it unknowingly dumb, would be like a layman's term for that. Conscious in incompetence, you know that you don't know and you're trying to get there, okay? Then you reach a level of uh, a conscious competence, you know what you know, okay? But you gotta think about it a little bit every time you go about an action. Then you get to unconscious competence. Let me give you an example of unconscious consciousness. Tying your shoes, okay? You can, do, you can tie your shoe, talking on the phone, looking at CNN at the same time without thinking about it. Many of us can get on a bike right now and ride it. You're unconsciously competent in these skills. So when you wanna master something, the level you wanna to get to is called unconscious competence, where you can do it on an automatic level. The reason why these guys are actually here studying, okay, okay some people wanna pass the class and get the grade, but ultimately there's a level of un conscious competence that you want to achieve. Okay, so these are some of the books that, that, uh, that allowed me to get to some levels of success. Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. As a Man Thinketh uh, by uh, Alan Frankel. Uh, the Strangest Secret by Earl Nightingale. Uh, Imagination and Its Power by Navel Goddard. Uh, the Secret and the Power by Rhonda Byrne. And just to make this clear, Readers are leaders, 
Okay, readers are leaders, guys. You gotta read. Okay, um, and besides, this is the information age, right? Okay, information age. It's not the the uh, the industrial age any longer. It's the information age at this point. So down at the bottom is the little stars called IQ. Okay, this is another secret. IQ is actually a reading program that will help you to read faster. So I went from 543 words a minute, okay, to now reading 1,950 words a minute. It's a big difference, okay? It's a very big difference. And it's only uh, $99 a year, okay? It is absolutely phenomenal, okay? You gotta use this because the future is for our leaders, but our leaders are readers, which means that you gotta incorporate information. And not only do you have to take this information and incorporate it, because I've heard in the past that knowledge is power. Anybody agree with that? Knowledge is power? I'm glad that many people didn't. Knowledge is not power. <laughs> knowledge is not power. Directed knowledge to an end goal is power. When you can take that knowledge that you've accumulated and you can direct it to a certain goal, that, my friends, is power. Okay, you can accumulate all the knowledge you want, but unless you are directing it and utilizing it and applying it to some end goal, it's not power. Okay, just remember that. That's really, really important. So, what is this elixir of success? Okay, so when I would go to all these different talks, everyone would say, "Man, the imagination is the most important thing," and this is how you imagine. And I would leave, and I'll go, "All right, I'm going to imagine." So I also say, man, desire is the most important thing. So I would then focus on that. And everything was all separated, you know? But what I've learned is you need all of this, okay? Imagine baking a cake, or baking cupcakes, actually, since I am the cupcake monster. Let's say you bake a cupcake, right? What do you need? Flour, you need the, the thank you, baking powder, milk, milk eggs, frosting stuff, right? Now, can you bake cupcakes without eggs? No. no I like that. No. <laughs> no. So the question is, can you achieve without auto-suggestion? And I'll tell you an equivocal no. I've been there. I had a company called 2G Valence when I graduated here as a clothing company. It was super successful. But my auto-suggestion, my own self-talk was, I'm just Eric. From, from LA, who's gonna buy this stuff? It was in like four different stores. We had great sales, but it was self-sabotage because my ideal of myself did not match the self-image of who I was. I was just thinking of myself as, you know, this guy from LA, just trying to make some clothing. You know, I'm not Jay-Z who had uh, Rockaware or Carl Kanai had his line or Ralph Lauren, you know, I'm just Eric. And that eventually failed, okay? Um, but number one, desire. Uh, according to um, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 Napoleon Hill, he said, in order for you to achieve success, you have to have a burning desire. And what I used to do is try to sit and just make myself like hot with this desire, like, yes, I really want it so bad. But that's not what he meant when he said white hot desire. What he meant by that was having the perfectly clear idea of what it is you actually want to achieve. Seeing the end result of what it is you're attempting or desiring to achieve in your life. That is the white hot desire. It's a clear mental picture of what it is you truly want in your life. Okay, faith. Listen, if you don't have faith, it's going to be a tough road for you guys. And I'm not talking about the faith that you project to your friends, the faith you project to your family, the faith you project to your uh, significant other. It's your real, true, innermost faith, because that innermost 
faith is a part of your self-image. That's going to determine your self-talk. That's going to determine how you make your mental images of your success, how you make your mental images of your success and how you think determines the words that you speak. The words that you speak determines your action because action is thought in motion, words in motion. You can never make an action without the wording. You can never make the words without the thought. You can never make the thought without the thought form, and you can never make the thought form without the idea. And every single one of those, all the way up from the idea to the action, ultimately gives you the result or manifestation. And so all of these components are important. You gotta have a clear mental picture of what you want. You gotta have faith in yourself and your abilities in who you are as a person, as an individual, you have to be able to talk to yourself like a coach. One, two, there's two ways to talk to yourself, okay? There is a, I am successful, I am wealthy, I am healthy. Then there's another component that says, you are successful, you are healthy, you are wealthy, right? And so what scientists, Forbes, Newsweek, and scientists have determined at this point is it's the you component that really makes the difference. So in other words, you need to be a coach of yourself. And what most people are doing is walking through life wanting someone to motivate them and to coach them to do the right thing. Okay? Specialized knowledge, if you're a chem major, bio major, physics, whatever that is, you gotta have that knowledge to be able to do what? directed towards a certain goal. Mastermind group is this, simple. Birds of a feather flock together, okay? People who are successful tend to hang out with other people who are successful. People who are failures tend to seek other people who are failures because everybody vibrates on a certain level and you can only resonate with who you're vibrating with. Anybody know what res resonating is? Okay, so if there's two pianos in a room and I go and hit the G key, ding, on this piano, okay? Which key is gonna resonate on the other piano? The G key, okay? So the frequencies resonate together. So this is why when you're in a room with some people and someone walks in with a negative attitude, they just had an argument, they're really unhappy, you can feel that energy change. And the only thing you really truly say is, oh, Carrie has bad vibes, right? That's bad vibrations, okay? So the other thing about that is, while birds flock together, guess what? Eagles don't flock. Mm. You ever see a bunch of eagles flying together? Anybody? No, you see ducks, sparrows, you even see a, a, a fish, you know, a, the, a, a fish, school of fish that hang together. Sharks, you know, they go hunt together, but they don't really hang out together, right? Eagles do not flock. Eagles always make their homes high up, right? And they hunt, they do their things on their own. And when they're looking out and you look at their eyes, they're not guessing. They have a glare and determination about where they're going, what they're gonna do and how they're gonna do it right now, okay? So my, my, my advice to you guys is think like eagles, okay? All right. This is a Leonardo da Vinci drawing of the human being. This is the human body, right? The arms, the, the torso, the legs, and in between. This is the human body looking at all the important components, the different organ systems, the nervous system, brain at the top, eyes, heart, uh, cardiovascular system. You have your integumentary system, your skin, all your muscles and bone, okay? You have your renal system, kidney, and everything else. Right? And all of these systems work together, okay? This is a picture of the muscle, right? This guy's kinda, I stole this from Shutterstock. But the point here is that uh, there's levels of a human being, right? So the question is, where does all this come from? It comes from this. If you take the human being as an organism, the human being has organ systems, okay? What are the organ systems made of? Tissues. What are tissues made of? Cells. Cells made of molecules. Molecules ultimately made of atoms. So just stop thinking for a second and just focus on this. The human being starts 
at the atomic level. And this is important because I'm going to make a point with this. The building structure of everything is atoms. The building structure of a human being at its fundamental particle is atom, atomic. Okay? Here is a picture of the atom. Okay? The nucleus, all the protons, the different levels and stuff like that. And an interesting phenomenon that Niels Bohr found was that when different electrons jump from different levels, they emit photons or photons of light called quanta, quantum packets. This is where the quantum mechanics, uh, um, uh, the nano level in our world come into play. Okay? Um, this is kind of like a, you know, the book drawing and everything else, right? The protons and neutrons. And protons and neutrons are actually made of something else called quarks. The interesting thing about quarks is at their closest level, they have the weakest interaction. But as they get pulled apart, the interaction grows stronger and stronger as opposed to weaker and weaker. And then in between there, new quarks are formed. So you can never really pull uh, the nucleus apart. It will make new uh, components. But this is what the atom kind of looks like in the more maybe spiritual sense of the word. Um, kind of like a solar system whizzing about doing this thing, okay? Nice and bright, shiny. This is another picture of the human body, but the point here is two things. Number one, how do we see? Because remember, we talked about visualization. We're going to talk about it a little bit more, but how do we actually see? Raise your hand if you think we see with our eyes. Anybody? How do you see? You didn't raise your hand. How do you see? My eyes. Your eyes? <laughs> eyes? 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 Brain. Who? Brain? Where specifically? <laughs> Back. <laughs> occipital lobe. You're right. We do not see with our eyes. We see with our occipital lobe, which also explains the reason why two people, five people, ten people can look at one thing and have a perception of five different aspects of what it is they see. Because the eyes is, uh, uh, the eye is an extension of part of the brain called the diencephalon, okay? And it sends tracks back to the occipital lobe and then you interpret the light signals based on your previous experiences. So based on your filters, based on your beliefs, based on who do you listen to. That's why it's important to determine who are you listening to. Are you listening to your friends who may be successful or someone who is successful that's actually guiding you? It's a big, important thing. But the other thing I want to talk about here is this. Here's the brain. Here's a nerve called the vagus nerve, right? The vagus nerve comes down into this region and connects with something called the solar plexus, okay? The brain to the vagus nerve to the solar plexus. The brain to the vagus nerve to the solar plexus. The brain, vagus nerve, solar plexus. The reason why that's important is because the solar plexus, what scientists and other um, metaphysical gurus have described is, that's like your place of the soul, right? That's why sometimes you go, got a bad gut feeling about this, right? Or I got a good gut feeling about this. What does your gut say, Charlie, right? That's that gut instinct. But the important thing here is we think with our brain. It connects to the vagus nerve that then connects to the solar plexus that helps us feel certain things. And over time, those impulses of thought will allow that solar plexus and your feelings to get built to get made, to be produced. In other words, the way you think affects how you feel. That then affects how you behave. That then again affects how you think and how you feel based on that behavior. If it was a good behavior, you're like, hey, two thumbs up, I'm happy about that. If it was a bad behavior, sometimes we go, I don't know what I was thinking, okay? There's times when I think back being here, I was like, I still to this day don't know what the hell I was thinking when I did that dumb thing, okay? It just happens. But the point is, is that the brain, the vagus nerve, solar plexus, feelings 
that then affects your thoughts, that then affects your behaviors. Okay? And you'll see why this is all important. I'm building this up to something, okay? Now let's talk about be, do, have. In order to have something in your life, you got to do certain things. In order to do those things, you have to be. Okay? You're not a human doing. You're a human being. The thing I want to get rid of is doing because how can you possibly do something to the excellent, superb level if you're not that person to do it? You know, a scalpel in a regular human being's hands that's not a physician is a dangerous thing. Okay? They don't know how to do, right? They're just swiping, stabbing, jabbing. Okay? There's a certain way in to hold it. There's a certain level of precision. There's a certain way of making the incision, right? You don't get in there and just stick it. I mean, this is like cutting up a pig, right? You stick it in there or whatever else. But if you're trying to get down to the abdomen, you want to get to the gallbladder, that's not how you're going to go about doing that, okay? So you can't, uh, you know, you can't do what a surgeon does, right? Because you don't be that. So the question is, how can we do that? How can we get to that point of being successful and making ourselves um, the man or woman that we want to be. Well, Alan says, as a man, or, actually he said, as a man thinketh uh, in his heart, so is he. I change it to, as a man or woman thinketh in his or her heart. Did I say his or her? Uh, in his heart. His or her heart, okay. Uh, so is he or she. Marcus Aurelius said, a man or woman's life is painted by his or her thoughts. Okay, Albert Einstein said, the future of your life is determined by the imaginations of your mind today. So there's an important connection there. Okay. The self-image we mentioned earlier. I want to get back to that because if you can see now that the thoughts that's traveling through the vagus nerve that's impacting how you feel, that impacts your behavior, well, you can't think any more beyond your own self-image of who you are. OK, it's an idea, a concept, conception of who you are. Self-esteem is how you think about your overall self-image. Your self-image is who you think you are, which, by the way, could be real or unreal based upon your perception. Your self-esteem is your overall thoughts about the self-image of yourself. Does that make sense? Good. Next. So. Question is, how do you become that which you are not now, but you're trying to be? Everybody in here is trying to work towards something. You guys are working towards your degrees, your careers, and everything else. But if you're not that, you know, how do you make something out of nothing? It starts with an idea first. Okay. The next question is, how does a contractor build your beautiful home? What's your name? Taylor. Taylor. How would a contractor build your home overlooking the ocean, Santa Cruz Hills? How would he do it? Yeah. He'd do it. He'd do it, yeah. Based on what? Okay, what specifically? You, you want to build a house, you need a foundation. foundation and vision. vision and what's another word for vision when you're building something? Blueprint. Thank you. Blueprint. Okay, you need a blueprint. Okay. Here's a definition of blueprint from uh, the Miriam uh, Webster. Okay, it's a photographic print, white, bright, blue background, right? This is for architects. Okay. Then it says something resembling, something resembling a blueprint. Or a model for providing guidance. Something resembling a blueprint or a model providing guidance or the image or the blueprint for success or victory. So let's just, uh, I don't know how to go back. I'm just gonna leave it here. Before I said, uh, uh, how do you make something out of nothing? We start with an idea, okay? In order to build a thing, you need a blueprint or a model, right? Or you can actually call it the end result. Right? What's the definition of an idea? According to Webster, you know, it's a real pattern which exists, a plan for action, 
a visible representation of a conception, a replica of a pattern, uh, an image that's recalled by memory, okay? But then when I got to, to see, I had to put this in darker writing. It says, an entity such as a thought, a concept, sensation, or image actually or potentially present to the consciousness. Actually or potentially present. That means that this computer could be an idea. It can be here or it cannot be here, but it can be here in my mind. That's what that means. Do we got that point? It can be a real thing in your hands or it can be some kind of conception of an ideal in your mind. This is just kind of going over that. We just talked about it, okay? Now, the brain is also changeable. It's malleable because guess what? There's something called plasticity. Every time you learn something new, your neurons either gain a stronger connection or your brain will actually grow and change to accommodate the things that you want to learn so that you can recall that later or you can utilize that information. It's called plasticity. And so when you're learning something and you're growing and you're becoming something, your brain is going to change structure. When you're in class and you get that answer and it's like right off, it's rolling off your tongue, you've created stronger connections or new connections that will help you recall that information. It's called plasticity. Plasticity is remarkable in that, technically speaking, if you learn something new, your brain changes shape. Does that or does that not make you into a new human being? How many people say, yes, it does make you into a new human being? Okay, good, yeah, it does. You change, every time you go to these classes and you're learning this information, by definition, your brain is different than it was two weeks ago. By definition, it has changed. It makes you into a new person. You think differently, you act differently. The classes that you took last year are like a breeze, which is why when you become juniors and seniors, you can go back and start to tutor those guys at the lower levels because you've reached a certain level of mastery, your brain has changed, you're comfortable with that information, and you can move forward with that. So, this is what I really wanna to get to. I had to tell you all of that to tell you this, okay? So when we talk about how do we become something that we are not currently, and how do we get to that point? This is the formula, right here. This is it, okay? <clears throat> If you look around this room right now, just take a look around everything, the walls, the lighting, the design up here, the computer, the cameras, the microphones, your clothing, the chairs, right? If you really wanna be honest with yourselves, we're living in other people's imaginations. All of these products are done. All of these products had to have come from someone's mind, like, like seriously, like this. Okay, okay, so these, these, these chairs with the shiny things on here, like, I would have never made that. Honestly, I would not have. I would have kept these, the, the armrest and the bottom chair the same as the back and just left it just like that, okay? But someone else has a different idea, and now we're living in their world. The guy who invented the um, laptop, we're now living with those products, right? So everything that ever was existed has gone through this mechanism, okay? So let's talk about it. First, there's always an idea. Based on that idea becomes a thought form. Thought forms is kind of like the earth becoming the earth, hot ball of molten wax or molten metal, or whatever it is, and now it forms into the waters of the earth and the, the, the continents. Then the thought, it's like the completed earth. Your thought form becomes a thought, okay? How do you express a thought? You express a thought through words. Words, as I mentioned earlier, is thought in motion. How do you express the wording? Through action and the work, okay? Action and the work that you're doing is words in motion. After that, you end up with the result or manifestation, 
Okay, we're already talking about the difference between creation and evolution. The point here is there's nothing that was ever done that was ever created that didn't go through this to some degree. And so now what I want to introduce is how to use this mechanism to your ultimate advantage. Because remember when I said, is there anything like a coffee machine? If I want to make coffee, I can just go put it in and, 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 and get the thing going like a machine. OK, this is it for the human being success mechanism. This is it. This is how you're going to do it. This is how you have been doing it unknowingly. But now what I want to teach you is how to do it on purpose, how to get the success you want on purpose without an accident. And then in another maybe 15, 20 years, you'll be back here saying how you did it. OK. So when we look at thoughts, OK, thoughts develop in the brain based on a conscious effort. OK, cerebral cortex. After that, the hypothalamus will release proteins in your body based on the thoughts that you have just generated. Those proteins then interact with cells. Those proteins interact with cells on the cell membrane that then translates down into the membrane and something else happens right within the cell and that protein and stuff like that. So basically, when we're thinking these thoughts, these proteins are getting released. They interact with the cells. The cells then are on the same frequency of that thought that was generated by the human being, which is why sometimes you can look at a person and feel that energy and you can know they're not either in, they're in the either bad mood or good mood or are they sad. It's more than just facial expressions. Because a lot of people have learned to become very good with hiding the facial expressions and everything else. But here's an interesting thing. When we get to the atomic level in the cellular structure, everything happens at that molecular level. Those atoms also release photons. So your cells, the 173 trillion cells in your body, are also releasing photons of light. In 1928, Sinclair actually took a photograph of that aura. You can look it up on Google. But he took a picture of that. So it's called biophotons, OK? Very low. We can't see it, but they're there. We can always feel it. In terms of cellular actions, uh, we already talked about that, how that interact. So, this is a kind of long slide, but the point here is this. Dr. Lipton determined that he's a molecular cell biologist. And when I was growing up, when I was here, everybody used to say that the nucleus of the cell was the brain. OK, the nucleus of the cell is the brain. What Dr. Lipton determined, they took the nucleus out and they found that the cell actually underwent respiration. It actually underwent digestion until the proteins that were performing these actions denatured and they didn't work any longer. So what they found actually was that the nucleus is more like the gonad of the cell to go ahead and reproduce more protein so that it can function. But why is that important? Because what they found was that the cell membrane okay, is actually more like the brain of a human being. Okay? It interacts with the environment. It gets stimuli from the environment. It processes that stimuli. And it does a reaction okay, to the external stimuli. Now. Your brain is inside of your skull. But here's an interesting point. When you were just a little tiny cell, there were three components, an endoderm, a mesoderm, and an ectoderm. The endoderm is your entire digestive system, all the important organs. Your mesoderm includes your integumentary system, your muscles, and bone. The ectoderm, what's the ectoderm? Skin, who said that? You. Skin and? No. And? Brain. Ah, what? I saw that face like, wait, what? The brain is ecto? Yeah, the brain is ecto. It's outside. Well, but the brain is inside the skull. Hmm. But. Your eyes are an extension of the diencephalon. That's outside. Your ears, okay, auditory canal, 
the south side, your tongue taste sensation, the smell, feeling, proprioception, okay? That's all outside. If you think about it, you're just one big cell. That's how your cells are. And the important thing that Lipton realized in this and what they said was that your beliefs and your perceptions can actually change the way your genes respond. Because most people go, oh, I'm just like my pops, that's it. No, that's not it. It's not over. You can actually change the way your physiology interacts and works by the way in which you think, which is very, very powerful. Okay? The other thing here is that there's only two phases of a human being, love and growth or fear and anxiety, okay? If you're in love and growth, your immune system functions properly, your digestive system functions properly, you feel good, okay? Now, if your immune system, digestive system for your nutrients and you're feeling good in love and growth, do you think that you will have a higher propensity towards success? Absolutely. The opposite end of this is fear and anxiety or fight and flight. It's the thing you, that happens when you see a lion or a bear coming at you. Protection, your eyes dilate, okay? The blood from your gut pushes out to your muscles and it's all this movement, motion, action on the physical level. Well, if you're in fear and anxiety, it's the same thing that happens during finals. So now you know why a lot of people get sick, right? All those cold sniffles around the library during finals time, all the stress levels that's increasing, the immune system gets suppressed, and that organism is not in love and growth. There's no mixing of these, guys. There's only love and growth or fear and anxiety, okay? That's it. Okay. Um, Okay, this is important because your eyes and the cells like a camera, the, uh, uh, the cells will capture what's going on externally, make a point, and then when you open your eyes, you mentally visualize uh, images um, of stress. That will change your physiology, because remember what I told you, you don't see with your eyes, you see with your brain. So can you close your eyes? Let's try this right here. Everybody close your eyes for a second. Okay, close your eyes. Close your eyes, everyone. Close your eyes. Think of your fondest childhood memory. Think of the person you loved the most as a kid and see how that feels for you. Now imagine that grizzly bear coming towards you right now. Rawr! Imagine the tiger walking through this library right now. Do you feel the sensation of the emotional difference just in that quick split of a second? You guys felt different with that, with those thoughts. Am I right or wrong? Okay. It's that simple. It is that simple. I know it sounds crazy. I know you are like, dude, I really want to hear just believe and achieve. But it's so much more to that. So much more than that. Okay. This is an unfailable mechanism what I'm gonna teach you guys here. So here it is. This is the biological response. The human being thinks, proteins are released based on that thought, they interact with the cells of the body, it translates into positive or negative messages, light is emitted from those cells based on that thought, other human beings can sense it, right? Or your brain or your body will make you move in a certain way to achieve those goals, okay? But there's a higher level. There's a vibrational response. And everything is the same, the energy, except that this same energy interacts with a universal essence, a universe, a God, whatever it is you want to call it. Um, this is also based on string theory. Okay? And then what happens, the universe, God, entity, or whatever you want to call it, then acts on that thought. And as it acts on that thought, it will give you the frequency of the energy of the thought in the way of people, events, or circumstances. 
cognitive dissonance, okay, is, actually, I don't want to talk about that. If you get this right here, this is profound and it's absolutely true because you guys have all experienced this to some degree, but you've never really been able to kind of put it all together and piece it all together based on your feelings and your thoughts, how this person will interact with you, this situation and circumstance. All of your, the people in your life, the events that occur in your life, the circumstances that occur in your life are a direct result of your own thought. And this is what I learned. And this is what has allowed me to achieve a success rate that is astronomical. I'll tell you, after I graduated from UC Santa Cruz, every single job I applied to, I got. Every single one. Every single program I applied to, I got in. Every single time. But it was after I learned this, because what a lot of guys are doing, like with the MCAT, it's like going to Vegas. <laughs> They're shaking up the dice like, hey, blowing this for me. <laughs> and they throw it out, acceptance. Ah, damn. Wait list. Right? They're hoping they get in. It's like shooting the craps. This is how you do it on a purposeful level. Okay? So I just want to go back to this again. Your thoughts come from your thought form, that come from an idea. Your thoughts impact your words, your words impact your action and the work and the manifestation. Um, this was the chemical bond I mentioned to you because you can't have a chemical bond without love. So I wanna come here for a second. Because before I told you that it's all mixed in, all together, and then I gave you that formula. Well, what I wanted to do is take these concepts and introduce these concepts to show you where they fit into that model where I just explained to you how you can achieve and become anything you want to become. So the desire, okay, when, I, when you're talking about an idea, that's impacted by your beliefs, okay? How you believe, what you believe in yourself determines the ideas that come to your mind. That creates the thought form. Your thoughts, okay? We talked about desire being a very clear picture of that which you want to achieve, okay? Uh, we talked about the faith, the imagination, right? Your thoughts are in your imagination. Are you imagining the best? Are you thinking the best about yourself? Do you actually see a clear image of where you want to go in your life? When you get down to the words, that becomes the section for auto suggestion because you can be thinking that you want success. I want success. Oh, I, I just really want to be a millionaire. I really want to be a lawyer. Okay. But if you're thinking that, but you're saying to yourself, I don't really know if I can do this. I don't really know if I'm the person to go to law school. I don't even know if I can make it through, but I really want to do it. There's a disconnect. The square peg is not fitting into the round hole. Okay. It can't happen. When you look at the alignment, it has to be the idea, the thought form, the thoughts, the words, the action, the work in alignment like that straight down the line. If the idea, the thought, the thought form, and the thought are here on a higher frequency level of success, but the wording to yourself is not, you are not going to succeed. Because I'll tell you right now, when I go to Google and I type in UC Santa Cruz Science Library, I don't want Google to tell me, I'm trying to find that for you. I hope I can find it, Jackson, okay? I wish I could find a library for you. Does Google ever tell you that? No, why? Why? Because it's not programmed. It's programmed to find things for you and give you that direction. And that's based on the language, HTML code, right? They program this thing for success, okay? Your human body, 
is also like a machine and it's programmed by the language. You cannot be successful with negative talk, negative self-talk, negative perceptions of yourself, negative self-image, and most importantly, negative auto-suggestion. Because think about this, for example. If the words is, I'm trying, then the actions based on the wording is also gonna be a try. And I'm gonna give you an example. Can I have one volunteer? Just one, come on up, man. I'm gonna show you what is doing and trying because all there is is doing and trying, okay? Come on up, right here, okay? This is a glass case, okay? Here it is, grab this case. All right, th thank you for that aggressive grab. Give it back. <laughs> Would you guys agree that was a grab? I mean, he went at this earnestly, <laughs> like seriously, right? It's mine, right? That's a doing, correct? Is that doing? Do we all agree that's doing? Good, do it again. Grab this, grab it, good, give it back, thank you. Is that doing? That's doing, correct? Let's do it one more time. Grab this case, okay, give it back. That's doing. Now, let's have them demonstrate trying. Try to grab the case. Okay, give it back. He grabbed it, that's doing. We already established that's doing, okay? but I want him to show us trying to grab the case. Nope, that's a grab. Uh, all right, yeah, yeah, okay. Don't move, stay right there. Don't move your hands, don't try to open your mouth and bite it and grab it, and then grab the case, okay? He can't do it, that is trying. Do you see the difference? There is no trying, guys. There's only doing or not doing, and this is based, thank you, appreciate it, thank you so much. <laughs> and this is based on what this guy is saying to himself over and over and over. All you really need is 51% of more positive than negative to tip the balance for yourself. So everybody's negative against me. I'm 10 years old, I'm in South Central LA. Every, there are no black docs, I got family members that saying, you too black to become a doctor. <laughs> so I'm in this area where I'm too white for black people and I'm too black for white people. I'm not Asian, not even a little bit. The Native Americans have stripped my Native American aspect from me because I'm also too black for that. I can't hang out with the, Lat with the Latinos because although my father's parents are from Dominican Republic and Andorino, that's still too black, or too Native American, or too this, or too tall, or too fat, or my shoes are not good enough. So I'm constantly in this battle of all of these external factors coming towards me, telling me all the negative aspects of why I cannot do what I set out to do. Hopefully that's not the case for all of you guys. But that was my story, this is my journey and how I, how I overcame that, unknowingly at that time, I did not have this mechanism, but it was something along these lines, okay? So, let's see here. Uh, can, I, can I go back on this, Yoop? Can I go backwards if I wanted to? The arrow, this one, okay, perfect, okay. Thank you, so uh, let's see here. Um, no, it's not here. All right, so what I did was this. I did not realize that my thoughts affected my feelings, my feelings affected my behavior, and my behavior affected my thoughts and feelings, vice versa, it goes around a circle. But I did notice that some days I was on fire. Man, I was studying hard. I was hitting the classes, okay? I felt good about myself. Other days, I couldn't study worth the lick. I'm in the library just looking around, you know what everybody else is doing, twiddling my thumbs, not getting much done, okay? Not feeling good about myself. What I did not realize is all of these interactions, these social interactions, the social impact was impacting me on this level of thought that I was creating my self-image based on the people who said I couldn't do it based on someone else who I thought was more successful than me, but I couldn't, I couldn't even imagine how to get there, okay?
So I was in this kind of space of who am I, really? What am I doing? Where am I going with my life? You know, when I was here, as I mentioned before, I was all physical. Man, I worked so hard. Okay. Um, uh, 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 one of the best moments for me was getting the A in that guy's class. Okay. And Phil Cruz class and in physics and everything else. And everybody going, dude, how in the heck are you doing this, all these things? And at the same time, you're still getting these good grades and you're still excelling. And the way I did it was, one, I did have a strong faith in who I am and my abilities. That I can say for sure. But I can tell you, I did not have the positive self-talk, not even a little bit. So I overcame that by the actions. And that's why I, it was so much harder to get the things done because I did not have that visual component of myself in that position, in that self-image, or actually being the person who can do it. I was a guy who was in Vegas shooting the crafts and going, I hope this works out. Unfortunately for me, it did. But I was hardcore with it. I was camping out in this library before it was this fancy, okay? Literally. I was in this library with the, with the little uh, diagrams, <laughs> making all the little OCAM diagrams with, the, with the, uh, uh, the little sticks and the models and stuff like that, you know, and I'll doze off and sleep on them. Okay, here, okay. Um, then I would be in practice, in, in, in uh, uh, practicing and rehearsal for the play. Then I would be in basketball practice. Then I would wake up early and just go hardcore. It's just this hardcore mentality of, at that time, work hard, play hard. That was my mentality. I'm gonna work hard. I'm gonna get the stuff done I need to get done. Then I'm gonna have fun I'm gonna play hard. And I'll tell you, when you work hard and you play hard, it makes the partying a lot more fun because you're not there at the parties concerned about what you actually need to be doing. But I changed the work hard, play hard into work, work smart, play harder. Work smart, play harder. This is working smart. And so whenever I start a new website, whenever I start a new project, whenever I start anything, and I got these guys coming to me and they say, hey man, I got this map, I got this model and everything else. I never start up here. I'm never there. I'm always starting at the results first, the end result first. Because remember I told you about cybernetics? If you have a goal, it's here. No matter what comes up in your life, you're gonna hit that goal, okay? I had, again, family members, so-called friends, strangers, saying, how is it possible that your poor self from South Central Los Angeles, with no one else in my family being a doc, no uh, mentors, the only thing that happened for me was I had the faith in myself and then all of these other things. I had a lot of faith, okay, and a lot of work and actions. And it was enough to overcome, but this is a much easier way to do it. <clears throat> so I decided that if I'm gonna tell you guys this, I gotta tell you the whole truth and nothing but the truth and the whole story after I graduated. And there's a little vulnerability in that because some of these, some of the things that I've been through is a little bit embarrassing, but I'm gonna tell you because I wanna be real. There was a point in my life after I graduated from here where I was miserable. <clears throat> I was broke and broken. I was a teacher and I was homeless. I was living in the Mustang outside of CVS in LA in Culver City, okay? And it was during that time when I was at the very bottom um, that some of these components came about. I said, I can't go any further down. <clears throat> and so what I did at that moment is I took out this book that I had since I was in junior high. And the only thing the book said, this was my doctor book, okay? I didn't know how much that it meant to me at that time, but in this book was my own little mechanism that I was gonna use to be a doc. And I'm sitting here and I'm reading it and my initial thought in the first few days was, this is pointless. You're a teacher, I have nowhere to live. How are you gonna be a doc? And in that book, I had about 500 signatures of my signature as Dr. Eric Jackson Scott, MD. 500 signatures that I was signing over 
and over and over and over again. And then I was sitting there and I said, you know, yeah, that made me feel good. I'll keep doing that. So I kept doing it. Wee hours in the morning, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock, go to sleep, wake up, open the book. There it is. Then that led into the visualization of actually achieving the goal. That visualization continued to lead into the faith of achieving the goal. The faith then, remember when I told you when you think a thought, that energy comes in and it comes out as the light and it's a vibration that you can feel from other people? Well, someone felt that vibration from me and became a mentor and who taught me much of this. And at that time, I was like, Mo, her name is Monique Hunter. She uh, was a USC grad. Um, and she came into my life at the right moment. I said, uh, you know, well, what do you want to do? I'm, I'm a teacher now. I'm, you know. And it's funny because I was the science department chair at that time, the youngest ever. And um, she said, well, what do you want to do? I said, Monique, I really want to be a doctor. I want to be a pediatrician. And she didn't flinch. She didn't buzz. She said, the success that you seek is within. And at that time, after doing so much work and so much hustling for the things I wanted in my life, that concept was so foreign to me. I said, no, Mo, the medical school is at UCSC or uh, UCLA or UC, USC. That's where I need to be. She said, no, your success is within. I said, OK, I don't know what the heck she's talking about. So I kept going with it, kept learning it, kept going about it. And that visual concept of myself based on that one book and the concept of myself being in the white coat with the steth around my neck is the image that I had. She felt that image for me, fortunately. When I went over to USC to visit, we're in a group of 50 people. The dean was there. I had not met the dean. I didn't know who she was. And she looked at me and she said, you, you're right there. Come here. And I was like, me? Yeah, yeah, you. Come here. I go around and talk to her. Dean Alexander is her name. And she said, uh, sometimes when you go through a group of people and you see some individuals and you find someone with something called the it factor, you don't know what it is, you just know it when you see it. And I said, what are you talking about, you know? What she saw in me was the visualization image that I had of myself. And she took that and helped me and she ran with it. I had never met this woman before, okay? So then went, annihilate the MCAT, I got 99th percentile, I got into every school I applied to, I chose to come here, uh, uh, you, you, back to the West Coast to go to UCLA because it was home, and then I wanted to be near the beach. I was already in Cambridge for two years, it was horrible. And, um, but before that, and I kept working on this, I would write down, you know, I am a successful doctor. I am successful. I am uh, helping to heal people, okay? Every single day, because writing for me was my form of learning, so I just wrote it out every single day. Then I started to speak it out every single day. And I'll tell you something, the plasticity the brain plasticity that I introduced to you guys earlier, how the brain changes, began to change my brain. I began to see things differently. I began to feel differently about myself. I began to go, hey, you know, I don't know how, but I actually think I can do this. I don't know how, but I know that I can do this. Over time, those thoughts, those words, they crystallized into the success that I have today. And so, you know, two weeks ago, I saved the man's life, the best thing ever. He cursed me out at first. It's a true story. I'll share it with you real quick. This guy had a fall two months ago. Comes into the office, he says, hey man, my job sent me here because they want me to get discharged. Here's the paperwork, just sign so I can go. So I examined the guy, everything was almost normal except something called finger nose test, okay? 
the guy was off. So I said, sir, I think you need, a, think you need an MRI. He said, are you crazy? I don't need a damn MRI. I just came here to get discharged. That was two months ago. He was an older guy. There's two things you guys got to know about the brain and the elderly. It shrinks. <laughs> That's one. And in alcoholics. So the bridging veins are longer. So if the bridging veins are longer, any kind of little shakeup, they're at a higher risk of bleeding. The guy cursed me off from the time I told him to go get the MRI all the way out the door. The next day, I'm in another clinic. I get a phone call. It's one of my other buddies. He goes, hey, man, the radiologist called me and cursed me out. I said, what? He said, the radiologist called me and said, get this guy to the fucking neurosurgeon right now. Okay? I said, what? He sends me a picture. The guy had a bilateral subdural bleed. That was one of my best saves ever. Okay? That guy could have died just like that. So, Remember this, guys. Love or fear, love is all there is, okay? You gotta love what you do. You wanna be successful, find what you love. I love helping people. I love helping people grow. I love helping people go from here to here. I have about 65 mentees. Some are in high school. I have 15 on this campus right now. Um, and that's what I love to do, and it's, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, remember this. You will see the perception filters, okay? Your friends and family, don't worry about them. This is your life. You guys get the opportunity to choose, okay? Your filters can be removed. If it's not serving you, you gotta let that information go, okay? Uh, give love to get love, it's like a pendulum, okay? A pendulum, you guys imagine a pendulum? You give love over here, somebody receives, it comes back. It's like a pendulum. Your thoughts, it's like a pendulum. Okay, what you're putting out in the universe is coming back to you. It's like a pendulum, okay? And this is a true story. Your success is gonna be based on your thoughts that make you feel a certain way, that make you act a certain way, that gives us a, a frequency that's picked up by other human beings, that's picked up by the universe, God, entity, whatever else, and it gives you back on the level of your faith in the thought. Okay? Uh, I put this in all caps, italicize it, give gratitude every day because just like that pendulum, okay, you give gratitude over here, it's a thought of gratitude, it, re it goes out into the world and it's gonna come back to you as more. If you guys are Christians, somewhere in the Bible it says, he who hath shall have more, he who hath not shall lose that which he hath. Give, great, give gratitude for what you have in your life. Give gratitude for the snacks that you guys have to pay for today, okay? Give gratitude for your books, your professors. Your professors are here not so they can get paid. I can tell you that. <laughs> They're not here to get paid, okay? They're here because they love what they do. They love that look on your face when you get it. When you're there, you're confused, and then you finally, your eyes open up, and you're all brighter, and you get it. That's what drives these guys. Use your office hours. They love that kind of stuff. Just don't go ask, well, yeah, use your office hours. <laughs> Okay, you have the power, you have the power over your behaviors, okay, that you're gonna express. You are not a victim, you already win. You're already winners. You're here. You're winners. You didn't get in here on a victim mentality because, you know, um, uh, uh, whatever kind of social, what you, affirmative action. You know, you're not here because of that. You're here because you got the skills, the know how to be here, okay? Um, Invictus. I don't know if you guys ever heard of Invictus. Anybody ever heard of it? Okay. The very last sentence of Invictus says, you are the master of your fate, the captain of your soul. In fact, it goes, out of the night that covers me, as black as a pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. Through the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Through the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Through this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll. I'm the master of my fate. I'm the captain of my soul. That is Invictus. Okay? It doesn't matter what's in front of you. The obstacles does not matter. It does not matter what people think of you. It doesn't matter what people say about you because they're going to say things about you. They're going to think things about you, but it doesn't matter. What matters is what you think of you, how you think of yourself. What is your self-image of yourself? How hard do you want to go at it? 
How much do you want it? How hungry are you? I'm here right now because I was hungry for the success. I wanted it so bad to say that I made it despite what was going on in my life or despite the obstacles. I didn't want to be some other, you know, black dude on TV that you hear about, some other tragedy. That's not the, the, the meaning that I have for my life. I knew I had a purpose. This is part of it. Okay, and the reason why I say this is part of it, because five years ago, I told my mother that I want to do public speaking. But five years ago, I did not have the image or conception of myself doing public speaking. So I sat on it and I sat on it. This year, I wrote a resolution. I am going to get started on the public speaking. And then it went in the drawer. <laughs> and I said to myself, man, I got to do this. All right, I'm going to do it. I got this. So I said, all right, let me just start from the end. I said, I am a successful speaker. Two weeks later, I get this email from Nancy saying, hey, there's this event called the Human Success Book that we would like you to come speak at. I said, oh, man, that's perfect timing. OK, that is how uh, let me go back to it. That is me thinking something. And then the universe taking it, acting on it and presenting the people, the events and the circumstances to begin to move forward with that. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? All right, let's wrap this up, guys. Um, all right, failure talk is I will, I'm trying, I hope to, I want. Okay, that's not how you're gonna talk to succeed and program yourself. You can't program yourself to just hope for something. There's a lot of people that want to be rich, but they're not saying I am rich. Success talk, you, you can tell this to yourself. You are success, what's your name? Francisco. Francisco. Francisco, man, you got this, Francisco. God, this is you talk. This is Francisco talking to himself. All right, I'm taking this upper division class. I know it's difficult, but I got this. Francisco, you can do it, man. You are excellent. I am excellent. I got this. I'm going to do it. I am going to succeed. Get the mental picture of it, the energy of it, and then move forward in the action based on that. It's the self-talk that's going to get you there. I am statements, okay? I am smart. I am beautiful. I am successful. I am energetic, charismatic. I am athletic. You are what, whatever comes after I am is a statement to your unconscious of who you are and what you are, okay? Living your purpose, find what you love, be bold, set big dreams. The dreams that you should set is not a complacency dream. Oh, I'll just end up with a cubicle desk job right here. No. It needs to be big, it needs to feel scary, it needs to be something that almost seems impossible. For me, this, what I'm doing right now, was an impossibility. I did not have a road, did not have a way path, uh, a path uh, paid for me, okay? They said, do you wanna go left, Jackson? Do you wanna go right, man? And I said, I'm going straight down the middle. I made my own path. I trailblazed my own path. There's nobody that I know that came before me that did what I did to the extent that I did it. And I was not the first person, but the first person in the realm of where I am, my sphere of people and everything else. Uh, imagine the best for yourself. That requires some focus. Speak positively about yourself and to others. Because remember that pendulum when it goes out? So you got a pendulum of positive thought about yourself. Okay, it goes out to the universe. Excellent. You got a negative thought about someone else. It goes out to the universe and then it comes right back to you in the way of people, events or circumstances. Uh, don't stop until you win. And all parties benefit. You can win at someone else's detriment. You have not won. Everybody has to benefit in the in the transaction. OK. Uh, and then finally, work smart and play harder. OK. And uh, I think that's it. What time is it? 4.33. OK. Any questions from you guys? Um, did you ever try to impart any of this knowledge to like patients or coworkers? And if so, how? <laughs> Very quickly. <laughs> I can't go into this level of uh, depth, but the answer is yeah. I do try to talk to some patients who are receptive. 
Um, there's a time limit involved. There are barriers involved. In other words, there's more self-doubt in the world than there are people with a high level of self-esteem. And so because so many more people feel not feel so bad about themselves, they will project that and impart things and do things to make you feel bad about you as well. It's that resonant thing. They're resonating at a lower frequency, okay? They want you to resonate at that frequency or they're jealous of your success or potential success. But remember, if the thing that you want is that one vibration, you have got to get yourself to that level of the vibration to the person who be so that they can then do, okay? Yes. Slightly different question, but how did you get that 99 in cap? <laughs> 99th, oh, oh, you know what? I did not, uh, did we do that? Let's see. I'll tell you in a second. I thought I put that in here. Okay, actually, you guys need to write this down. Okay, take out your notebooks, write this down. This is important. I thought I put that in here, I apologize. But let's go over that and how to get straight A's right now. <laughs> you wanna know how to get straight A's? I'm gonna give you the secret right here right now, the formula. All right, number one, okay. Sunday is Sunday, okay? This is how you do it. On Sunday, you take the syllabus, you take the book, and you preview. Don't read it, preview. Look at the titles of the sections of the chapters. Look at the syllabus and what's important for this week. Look at the titles, skim, title, skim for all your classes, right? The idea is this, you wanna make your intro to the section in class the second time you see the material. So Sunday, you're gonna preview only. Then you're gonna to go to class, that's the second time, right? Okay. After preview is R, read. So as soon as you're done with that class, that day, those courses for that day, you gotta go and then read the chapter, read the notes, right? Then you're gonna do it the next day and then the next day. Then on Friday, what you're gonna do is go to the library, you're gonna sit down after your last class, you're gonna take out that syllabus, and then you're gonna review everything that you've done for that week. It takes about two to two and a half hours, okay? Sometimes three, depending upon the density of it. And then last Q, which is questions. So you wanna know how you get the 36 on the MCAT? You gotta do about 30,000 questions. 30 thousand questions. You want the 36, you want to kill the DAT, the dental aptitude test? You gotta do about 30,000 questions. Because what happens, remember this, when I told you about plasticity? Every time you're doing those questions, you're learning, you're building new synapses, the synapses are getting stronger. By the time you get to the test, you will have seen every kind of question there is thrown at you. You will have learned the material. And when you get to the test, it's like music, like a metronome, like tick, 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 tick. You're in this zone and it's just the constant knocking down the questions over and over and over again. Sometimes you get to the question and you actually won't know the answer but you will absolutely know that three of those answers are wrong. Cause you know that that's not, that one's not the one. That one's definitely not the one. That one maybe, oh yeah, it's that one. Yeah, that's right, okay. You'll get this familiarity of the material. You will have reached in that level what's called the fourth level highest. Conscious, Conscious confidence. Thank you, okay. You wanna get to that level of when it's automatic, it's just flowing off your skin. You become the material. That's how you do it. Sunday, you wanna preview your week. Go to class, make it the second time. After class, it's very important, not the next day, that same day, read the material. Friday, sit down, go over everything for the week, okay? The other thing is, I don't know if you guys ever heard of Quizlet. Anybody, you guys know about Quizlet? Quizlet is awesome because you can go there and get flashcards, okay? 
that's another way you can study flashcards and they're free. You can download them, you can upload them into your thing. You have them on your phone while you're riding around on the shuttle. That's study time. You want to maximize your study time. But you don't want to maximize your study time with the belief that you can't do it. That was one of the hardest things I was working against myself. I'm here thinking, oh man, I'm just this kid from LA. I don't know how to do any damn uh, organic equations. Then I got Nancy telling me, Eric, you can do this, man. The square peg was not fitting into the round hole because it wasn't coming from me. I had to overcome my own self-doubt about my abilities and stuff like that. So the answer to the question is preview on Sunday. Go to class, make it your second time. Read the same day. Friday, go over the week. Do questions part of the day on Saturday. Then enjoy the weekend. Enjoy the parties or whatever else. Okay, because you know you've mastered this. Now, you may be saying to yourself, I don't know if that works. Well, I'll tell you something. I got students on the campus right now that I told this to last summer who went from a 2.3 who are now getting straight A's. It, they email me, they call, you got another A, man. It's a true story. It's the fa most fabulous thing ever. If you use it, okay, you will get straight A's if you do this. Now, I've given you a formula. But unfortunately, that formula is only going to work to the capacity of your own self-image of yourself. You cannot get straight A's without seeing yourself as a straight A student. You can't achieve exceptionalism without seeing yourself as an exceptional individual. It just won't happen. Square peg will not fit into the round hole. When you have the concept of yourself, okay, in the self-image and the objective, the square peg fits into a square hole. And you, somebody raise your hand. You. Yes. The Oprah, sorry. The Oprah. Oprah. Oh. <laughs> so um, my mother has this crazy relationship with Oprah. She loves Oprah Winfrey like almost everybody else. And um, we, uh, as as I was graduating. Oprah Winfrey wanted to do a mother-son or mother-daughter kind of episode. And they called down to First Day of Me Church. And she said, oh, it's Oprah Winfrey. You know, we want to do this show and want to showcase, you know, um, mothers and sons or mothers and daughters. She said, oh, we got the perfect, I have the perfect person for you. And she told her and everything else. And then the producers called us. And uh, they came out. And um, yeah, it was about maybe a week or two of filming and everything else. And uh, yeah, that's, that was, that's, that's how it, it just came. Because my mother, I think my mother kind of magnetized that through her own bio photons, you know? Yes? Um, with, with recall and with uh, remembering things, specifically for like the MCAT or something um, to that effect, where we need to study it well, for six months or Oh, uh, for MCAS specifically? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So. Seven subjects now. Yeah, it oh, is. So um, when I studied the MCAT, that's what I did. I said, hey, if I want to reach the level of uh, 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 um, just this level of unconscious competence, then I need to know every subject, every topic. So I did was like two weeks of physics, two weeks of chemistry, two weeks of OCHEM only. Um, forgot the other section I was on there. But then. Um, while I was doing the chemistry, I would do every day of verbal reasoning. Because I hated verbal reasoning. It was like my worst part of the MCAT. It was just, I hated it. So I did every day verbal reasoning. And then, but you know, you can't run from it because you hate it, right? Because it's going to be on there. But every day I did verbal reasoning. And then I did about, I don't know, 50 to 75 questions a day for a long time. And then, I, then what you do is, if you want to know how to study for this, this is what you do. You do one or two weeks on each topic, specifically. You do tons and tons of questions. You figure out what you know well, what you don't know well. You got to be honest with yourself. You go back, you strengthen the weaknesses. You strengthen the strengths, OK? You do your weakest topic, whatever you're weakest in, every single day to get yourself to that point. Again, though, 
if you're doing it and you're telling yourself that you can't do it, that's combating against yourself. You have to give yourself a self-talk as well. When it gets hard and you miss those questions, like, ah, oh, I missed that one again, but I won't miss it next time. I got this one. Then I kept a separate section of what I noticed were uh, 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 systemic errors. Systemic errors are those things where you have things you study for, but you keep forgetting it, right? So what I did was I put all my systemic errors in one pile, and then I would constantly go over those over and over and over while I was doing a verbal reasoning, while I was doing other questions. So all of this stack, as you know, it kept building up, whatever, you know, over time, once I mastered and I got the question right, I would take it off that list. And by the time you get to the MCAT, there should be none of those cards there, right? Or the DAT or the LSAT or whatever it is, what other aptitude test you're taking, you know? Uh, and put yourself in that situation. You gotta be honest with yourself because what a lot of people do is they do what they feel comfortable at and what they're good at so they can feel good while they're studying for it. And they go, ah, oh, if that come up, I'll just fadangle with it and hope it's not there, right? Well, you gotta know these things. You know, I can't go, well, I won't go over, you know, how to read a chest x-ray, ah, I don't really want to do it, I hate it. You gotta do it because if a patient comes in, you gotta know how to read the chest x-ray, you know? And right now I believe there's pharmacology and stats on there now, so you know, you really wanna go into all of those aspects and quite honestly, the way the MCAT is looking, you might wanna actually start about a year in advance. It's a lot harder, you know why? Anybody know why it's a lot harder? Got to take that as a no. Um, the reason why is there were so many applicants for so many, for just so few spots. Over the years, when I applied, it was about 55, 60,000 applicants for 17,000 spots. Then as time went on, it was 70, 80,000, but the number of spots were not increasing dramatically. The good thing for you, 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 and you, and the front row, the second row, and one person in the third row is the number of women every year has been increasing ever since I got into medical school. The first year that there were more women getting into medical school than men was in 2003. Every year after that, there's been a consistently higher number of women getting into medical school than men, which means that we're heading more towards a more nurturing field. Unfortunately, you guys gotta watch for this because as you know, women tend to not get paid at the level of men the pay scale for docs going down, more so as a direct result of what Hillary Clinton did in 1982, 1992, but you also wanna walk in and stand up for your rights too. Don't get paid less than men, okay? Always ask for $10,000 more than what they offer you. And then give yourself some wiggle room on that, okay? And demand that, yeah. Uh, so you talked previously that you had about 15 mentees on campus. Uh, I just would like to know, uh, what do you have to do to find good quality mentors? <clears throat> well, one is you got to set forth that intention. Okay? And what I mean by that is you got to have the intention inside of yourself and in your heart and in your body to actually work with someone of a high caliber. And what you really want to do is work with someone that you can feel comfortable with, that you can talk to, but most importantly is at the level or some aspect of something that you want to do in life. That there is a beacon that's right there that you can actually focus on that can then guide you towards that level that you want to be at. And then talk to them, you know, to ask them about their time. Are they actually willing to be your mentor? Um, not everybody's willing to do that. You know, they're like, oh, my success is my success and that's it. You know, um, I, I think I was always of the mindset of, you know, just continually helping people and really truly giving back. And so, which is why um, I kind of bit off a large chunk of that as well. But um, yeah, if you guys ever have any questions, I'll give you my email address. It's ericjacksonmd at gmail, E R I C J A C K S O N M D at gmail.com. Just email me, you know, um, and uh, um, I'll, I'll get back to you and um, answer your questions and stuff. Any other questions? No. All right. <laughs>